Hasbro Selfie Series project all started years and years ago when we realized that our fans wanted to become the characters in the stories that they love. Fans are a very social group. They love to celebrate what they love. They like to get together. They like to dress up and cosplay their characters. But ultimately, they want to be immortalized in plastic, right? Fans just kept telling us, we want to become an action figure. I remember at a con years ago, we did a promo where we said, hey, we'll make the top five fans that win this contest into action figures. And it was so huge. People went crazy for that. It wasn't until recently that two technologies came into play at once. One is a very simple way to scan someone's face and head, and then a very affordable way to print that head in a one-off way. And when those two things collided, we said, hey, I think the time is now to launch Hasbro Selfie Series. And so we started pairing up the two and looking at that. Brian had chartered us with, hmm, how can we get this to market at scale? You hear so much out in the world about something that's made custom for somebody. But it has to be at scale. It can't be astronomically priced. We wanted to get it at a price point that everybody could partake in. When we first saw the scanning technology come in, we knew there was an avenue there. The materials were improving. All of a sudden, you could start seeing that there's a bridge between that prototyping stage into the production stage. And so we looked at all the technologies that are out there on the marketplace, and there's certain strengths that Formlabs offers that the other vendors do not. The partnership with Formlabs really evolved around, A, the creation of a custom resin, right? So we wanted to have a resin that was only available to us that could cover off all the different skin tones and hair tones that we would be looking to put into an action figure, as well as the quality. We wanted to make sure that we produced a custom figure that matched or was better than what we currently had on the market in a production figure. It's really a lot of iterative feedback from them when we do come up with a color formulation. Do you like the opacity? Is it too matted? Do you want it to be shinier? Do you want this color to be darker? Do I need a little bit more red in this one? Together with Hasbro, many rounds of iteration, we successfully deliver the colors that they're looking for. This project had demonstrated it's in a very short period of time. If you have a customer with a very strong, clear idea in terms of what the product they want it to be, and pair it with a company like Formlabs with really skilled scientists, we can really create a customized product very quickly and, and bring it to market. When we first started seeing the scans come off the Formlabs printers, we knew we had the quality down, we knew we had the skin tones down, we knew we had something there. 10 years ago, 3D printing was not in the place where it can reliably be used in these high value, high customization type of jobs, but we've gotten there. We have now the reliability, the precision that we can participate in manufacturing. Where 3D printing really shines is making one-of-a-kind products from one customer to the other customer, making small or large deviation in what exactly they want the part to look like. Mass personalization is kind of interesting, and the way I look at it is to the fan, we're delivering one figure. You know, there's nothing mass about it, right? It's that bespoke figure that is you, that you're gonna get in the costume that you want, with the hairstyle that you want, with your face on it. So you are becoming that action figure. Formlabs has really allowed us to do mass personalization in a scale we never could even imagine a few years ago. Without customers like Hasbro, we're not getting pushed to really the frontiers of, of what's possible with our technology. With 3D printing, you have the ability to literally day-to-day -day adopt what you're shipping to customers, and that's very valuable. Hasbro is about delivering these great experiences, personal experiences, to anybody who wants them. And that's what Formlabs is partnering with us and allowing us to do. It's what sets Hasbro apart from our competitors. We have to find ways to do things differently, to respond to trends, to fashion, to you know, where the consumer, the kids and the families are going, and, and be sure that we have products that compel and delight them. And I think what Hasbro Selfie Series is allowing us to do is have that ultimate relationship. It's the beginning of many opportunities that we'll talk directly with those fans and deliver the experiences that they are asking us to make. All right, I am uh, super excited for this panel. Uh, this is actually one of the um, ones I've been looking forward to the most. We're gonna be talking about the Hasbro Selfie Series, um, which was a collaboration with Formlabs to bring some of these amazing figures to the market where people get 
personalized action figures with their face on it. Um, so we have a lot of questions um, to ask, and I'm grateful here to have this panel. I'm Mike Baker. I lead the communications team here at Forum Labs, um, but mostly today we'll be hearing from these folks. So Patrick, why don't you start off with a little intro? All right. So thrilled to be here. So I'm Patrick Marr. I'm the Senior Director of Prototype Development at Hasbro. And uh, you know, we've been working on adding a lot of innovation into our pipeline, and I think Selfie Series is sort of the culmination of where we are today. So thrilled to be here. Great. Robert? I'm Robert McCowiak, and I'm in the RP lab at Hasbro, so we've been working with Form Labs machinery for a pretty long time now, and I've gone from RP tech up to the associate RP engineer and had the opportunity to work on this project. Awesome. Welcome. Hi. I'm Jesse Bergau. I'm the technical project manager slash applications team lead on the business development team. Um, so I had the pleasure of doing the project management for the Hasbro Selfie Series for the collaboration with Hasbro. Um, and I've been at Form Labs for about five years, and I've been working with Hasbro for probably four of those five years. Awesome. And so I think, like I said, this will mostly just be a, a conversation. We're going to hit on the genesis of the Selfie Series project, spend a lot of um, time going into the kind of technical aspects of it, uh, and then maybe talking about mass customization and what's next, uh, both for the Selfie Series and kind of the general idea of customized uh, consumer products. Um, I think everyone should know, we, we just rolled a great video talking about the Selfie Series before this, but as a quick uh, kind of description, this is just a new platform for unique uh, personalized fandom experiences. So as you can tell from these figures, uh, you can get your, your face, um, which comes through the 3D printing technology that we'll talk about, on a wide variety of some of the, the best um, uh, properties in, in fandom. And so uh, with that, I would love to hear from you, Patrick. I think you kind of definitely spearheaded this project for a while. Can you tell us where this idea came from, even before we get into the technical part about you know, the idea for personalized action figures? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're super excited about Selfie Series. I mean, finally, we can produce custom action figures for mass market. Um, before that, you know, we would do one-off custom figures for celebrities or for other corporate needs. And those were all hand-done, handmade, hand-printed. Um, but you can only do them in limited scale, right? And our fans have always been clamoring to how do you get that? You know, I want to be, you know, fully engaged with my superhero and, and uh, that experience. And so really it's a culmination of two technologies coming together, right? So we needed the opportunity or the means to sort of capture everyone's likeness and then produce something that was collector series quality. And um, really, that's really what Selfie Series is, is those two things have aligned, the technologies came to pass and... Uh, yeah, so we're excited to be here and talk about it. Awesome, and I guess to even, if I remember correctly, 3D printing had been kind of part of the, the Hasbro model shop before Selfie Series. Um, talk a little bit about kind of just the experience sure. with 3D printing before, even prior to Selfie Series. Yeah, so you know, 3D printing has been in our department since like late 90s, I would say, big industrial sort of corporate machines. And then um, we started partnering with Form Labs at, uh, when the, you guys came up with the Form 1. And, uh, you know, we sort of bought it as a, hey, let's kind of see what this technology could do. And through all the generations and the materials and the introductions that you guys have put forth, um, we realized how versatile the platform was and how we could leverage that for even more. Uh, they just sort of develop product development focused applications. Awesome. And so I think that is a good part. Jesse, maybe you jump in. You know, when Formlabs works with um, companies like Hasbro that kind of maybe you know, have experience with 3D printing, have been used it, but then have a bigger application that they have in mind, something that, you know, might require a little bit of customization or, or partnership. How does that look like? And, you know, use Hasbro as a specific example, but talk generally about kind of these collaborations. Sure, yeah. Um, so we do scoping like this sort of all the time with different customers who come up to us with their specific ideas. But we had sort of been talking about this with Hasbro for probably a couple years, just talking about how cool it would be if we could accomplish this. So once they sort of officially came to us with the idea, there was first of all a ton of excitement about, wow, where is this gonna go? What could we do with this technology? Um, but then also coming down to reality and saying, do we have the proper sort of building blocks in place to deliver a product that is you know, consumer good quality or Hasbro quality? So a lot of that came down to the material and making sure that we could provide a material that was sort of good for them and sort of pass all of their standards, um, but also talking with them a lot about what the future looked like. 
what is the scale of this product going to be? Where do you see it implemented globally? Um, and making sure that we had all the right building blocks in place from the materials, from the hardware, and from the software perspective. And then really assembling a team around Hasbro, a Form Labs team that could help sort of guide them over these next few years. Awesome. And I want to dive into all of those um, in more detail, but I think that sets the stage. You know, a project like this, super broad goals, really, you know, innovative and ambitious. Lots of technical hurdles to get there. I know that this is not an overnight thing. Um, I think this audience especially is kind of familiar with the idea of, of 3D printing and, and using it um, to create you know, custom um, products. Um, but Robert, I'd love to you, for you to tell us from the you know, first stages, how does this technically work? I think this is a pretty uh, unique project and so I would love to just kind of hear literally from the scanning part all the way to the delivering it to the customers what does this look like and what were the challenges that we had to overcome? Yep, so we scan with the Hasbro app on your cell phone and um, with our proprietary software within that, we get a mesh output that gets fed into the preform system, gets supported. We have our own supports that we've integrated into it, which comes into play later. And this gets fed to all of the printers that we have at the facility. So it was an interesting evolution from how I've always handled prints in the RP lab of we have to make one head for one figure on one machine. Uh, we had scaled up to the form cell to do action figures and that was kind of our first introduction to that mass processing but not the need for the customization end. So we needed something that was really flexible, but stayed within the confines of like, you're still kind of doing the same piece over and over again, but it's totally unique for each person. So goes through preform, gets printed on the form three, and then we have to do the post-processing process. And so, I mean, again, kind of going back to what Patrick was saying about uh, you know, historically there have been ways for people to do this, but on a one-off right. basis, yeah. right? Like right. a hand-crafted one. Obviously at the scale that Selfie Series is intending to reach, that's not possible. Were there challenges of kind of getting, you know, multiple uh, prints at once or really, you know, creating a system that works with um, a traditional action figure body? Like what were the kind of oh, yeah. questions that you had to answer? Yeah, um, material played a big role in that as far as fitting onto the different bodies. I mean, we have, it, all kinds of tolerances and mechanical features to consider, which I think was not like a shock to us, <laughs> but again, it goes back to the prototyping. Like we've always been used to, you can make it fit once you've printed it, but now we need something that you have to print it and it has to fit the same way every single time. So it was a different way of approaching printing out that object to have a standard. And like we, at Hasbro, we have our quality standard, but now we are facing the like manufacturing quality standard that well, I hadn't had experience yet. I don't think, yeah. At, at least with our three D printing, we hadn't had that kind of experience. Yet. It's yeah, it's a different mindset, right? Because you think about it, you know, if a part fails, you can add one more support, reprint it, and yeah. the next day you get your you know the replacement part. You start doing that at scale, you need to set it up and be repeatable every single time and through automating it so that, you know, the hands off sort of, you know, parts flow and they automatically get supported and printed um, just to keep up with that production volume. So different mindset, right? And so I think what we did was we leveraged the skill set of the department, uh, their understanding of the material properties, and then working with Jesse and team to kind of test over and over and over again. You know, we wanted to maximize that print volume, right? Make sure we're edge to edge on the platen, right? Uh, get consistent, reliable pieces off so that we knew that if we sent a batch there, that, you know, six hours later that we were getting a set of heads off. Yeah, and I think that's one thing that's actually pretty unique about the Hasbro Selfie series, and that kind of speaks to the challenges we have, is that this really is one of the first mass customized consumer goods that's going direct to consumer. Mm -hmm. We've certainly seen mass customization and personalization in the healthcare industry with dental or people who are using 3D printing for 
production, but not necessarily doing a customized product. And that just introduced a lot of you know, unique challenges that no one in the industry, I don't yeah. think, has ever really encountered before. Um, but Hasbro really just dove head first. And I think they did more work than I've ever seen a company do on the integration and making a very robust process. So from beginning to end, they've got many different integrators along the way that are ensuring that their customers are getting a really high quality part every time. And I think that kind of leads to the material question, which is it built on this, right? This is direct to consumers. It's you know matching. People have expectations about action figures. I think there's a lot of angles to dive into the materials. But Jesse, why don't you start talking about what you know? How Formlabs collaborates to come up with a material that hits all of the requirements that we need to for this company. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that um, I definitely personally feel that materials development and customization has become a real strength of Formlabs probably over these past five years, working with various customers from um, Hasbro, of course, to New Balance to Gillette. We really started to sort of flex those muscles and build up the infrastructure within the company that we need, um, such that when a selfie series opportunity comes, we can really address it. Um, so the first thing is having that foundation in place of having the ability uh, on a technical and the commercial side to say, yes, we can deliver this based on the scoping that you've given us, and we can do it in this timeline, um, and it's going to cost this much you know, per cartridge or per liter. So that's kind of the foundational aspect. Um, and then from there, you have to get into the technical perspective, which is, do we have a base material with mechanical properties that are going to pass all of the really extensive toy testing and the standards associated with toy testing um, that Hasbro, Hasbro keeps for itself? So luckily, we were able to find a material that we already actually had in our repertoire um, that passed a lot of their tests, pretty much all of them, actually. Uh, but that material is gray. It's like a sort of light gray, dark gray. It doesn't really look like any one not person. Very human. Yeah, it's not a very human color, for sure. Um, so that's when Hasbro really came to us and said, hey, we've, we found the material that we want. We know this is going to work for us. But now we need to work with you, with Formlabs, to, to create the materials that are going to re represent all of our customers. Um, and I think they did a really good job from the beginning of accentuating their responsibility to diversity and inclusion of making sure that anyone out there can see themselves in these figures. Um, and thus, with the materials, we ended up making about 12 different colors um, for both the skin color and the hair color, such that when you put any of those combinations together, we hope that kind of anyone around the world can see themselves on that figure. Um, and as part of the materials process, there's the, the color matching of making sure that we're staying to the sort of Pantone standards that they provided for us and that the material looks right under different conditions. Um, but also, like Robert was saying, that it's going to perform mechanically and have the right dimensional accuracy, such that when you put it on any one of these figures, whether it's from Star Wars or Ghostbusters or Power Rangers, that all have maybe slightly different tolerances, that it's going to fit the same every time and it's going to be safe for anyone to use. And I mean, Lots to dig in there. Yeah. <laughs> Very interesting part of the, the conversation. Material is a huge aspect of this. But would love, Robert or Patrick, I mean, so Jesse kind of alluded to some of the challenges that come with like a, you know, consumers are actually going to take these, some of them, take them out of the boxes and play with them. What are the, the things that you had, the, some of the tests that Jesse kind of mentioned? What are those types of tests? What are the properties that are really important uh, for creating something that is ultimately going to be in consumers' hands? Yeah, I'll take a step back. You know, when I first approached Gary and, and Jesse about the project, right? So we started thinking about materials and just kind of laid the foundation there. Here's what we're thinking to do. Here's what we'd like to do, right? And kind of, you know, they went off, did some homework, came back, and they had a couple of material recommendations for us. And, you know, we had already been using most of the uh, materials in their library, so we're familiar with them. We had our own ideas on which ones we want, where we wanted to start. And, you know, from there, we were, you know, it was kind of being dual path that they were having a lot of the testing done on their own, right? So they, they were going to have it, you know, approved for their use and with their customers. And so we're like, that's perfect, right? So the toy industry standards are relatively high between material properties and torque and tension. You know, we wanted to make sure that we age graded it down appropriately to our fans and so that we knew that it would pass all those tests. So we gave those strict, you know, sort of strict, you know, requirements to Jesse and team. They, you know, they kind of came back and recommended, uh, you know, the material that we ended up using. So, and from there, like Jesse said, it started out as a gray material. We had to go back to a white base and then, you know, develop a pigment system for that. Yeah, I think one thing that's kind of unique about the pigment system that we've created is that 
it is foundation. It's something that you can make many other colors off of in the future. Um, should selfie series sort of branch into new markets, whether that be human or, or otherwise, you know, there's a lot that we can do with this foundational material that we have and with the Form 3 Plus platform of ha having a platform that's very easily deployable sort of around the world. Yeah. And that was one of the challenges that we faced. You know, when we first started developing this, we were just coming off the Form 2s. And so we were switching platforms onto the Form 3s, getting used to that, and then but testing those materials. And I think, you know, that ended up being a very robust platform for us, you know, for that material quality, um, edge to edge, like I said, and getting that tolerance built in there, right? There's no other way that we would have passed all those torque and tension tests if we couldn't have that edge to edge uh, stability. And that makes me think of some of the fun challenges that we had with it's a brand new material it was a new printer for us and we just found a lot of uh, really interesting aspects that we hadn't faced with the form 2 or some of the more standard materials and combined with trying to meet those toy industry standards it was a lot of like serious back and forth development yeah yeah, yeah hasbro definitely pushed us throughout that time to make our products better to make better automation integration and to make sure that we are hitting the standards that they were setting for us of having very repeatable prints, being able to uh, sort of attest to a certain yield. And I think most importantly, that the dimensional accuracy was going to be the same on any given printer, on any given material. Yeah, and a lot of the classic like, well, it's working for us in our office, on our machine, like, yeah. like why are you getting different results? Yeah. And then just to touch back on the color for a second, because I think that's an important piece. It's not even just the concentration of the color. We were looking for a translucency that mm -hmm. matched the figures, right? So if you look at our, the production bodies in themselves, they have a you know, certain translucency to them. We wanted to match that to get that accurate skin tone. At the end of the day, we wanted the figures to be able to stand against the rest of the line and blend in. You should not be able to really disintegrate you know, which one was which, right? And so um, that took a lot of uh, you know, back and forth with, with the team. But in the end, I think we ended up with an amazing product. And that was also matching not just our existing figures, but matching the human element of mm -hmm. like we want to deliver something that's going to match someone's collection or match someone's uh, playing field of figures but also for the people who are like I want to see myself on a figure that material has to be able to reflect the plastic and the skin and yeah I mean and dive into that a bit more like that meant creating a range of different skin and hair colors and you know mixing them talk a little bit about like what the variety ended up being and how it may have changed over time uh, creating this something that as Jesse said started as a gray and then now as you can see kind of reflects the, the every every type of person that is you know wants a figure that looks like them yeah we we went through several iterations of like here's our spectrum Form Labs would deliver something back to us and we obviously want to make adjustments to it. And then I think we even had different series of, like we're talking about the translucency or yeah. how pigmented you want it. And we had a lot of back and forth with that where it's like going back to the human versus action figure, which one are you trying to meet? And just trying to get that middle value was it yeah, and, and we have our own diversity and inclusion team inside Hasbro. And so what we did was when we came up with the original color palette, we ran that by that team. And I think, you know, in the end, once we had done a lot of the investigation, we turned over our final specs to Jesse and team. You guys nailed it, like, yeah. pretty quickly. <laughs> I think we had done so much of the homework up front, um, and we were thrilled with the results. I, don't, I think we made it, might have done one round of changes, but maybe that, that was it. So, yeah, and from there we started moving along. Yeah. yeah, but they had really good scoping to begin with as well. Like they yeah. delivered a lot of samples to us that were painted in different colors or they had done their own mixing, kind of uh, experimenting with the Form 3. And by being able to deliver us something that they thought was very close, it was fairly easy for us to match it. Um, but also I think that speaks to the partnership and just how close we are as companies, both like uh, in our relationship and also physically. You know, we can send things back and forth very quickly and get a lot of feedback in the space of a week or two. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I think actually that's kind of a good segue. One of the, in the video that we showed before this, one of my favorite quotes is from Ryan Chapman who, uh, from Hasbro who talks about, 
you know, this is mass customization, and we'll talk a little bit about at the end about why that's important and where it's going. But for the consumer, it's not mass. You know, for a consumer, it's it's one of one, right? And so that I think is what makes this project unique and and, and so interesting. But it's also what poses the challenges for scaling. Um, and so I'm curious. You know, we talked about all the QA that went into it. We talked about the the material development to create something that, when you get it, feels great uh, and looks great. But what were the challenges to doing this at scale, knowing that a lot of people are going to want this, and 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 that that is a kind of tricky thing to deliver something that used to be hand painted and, and and only able to do by an artisan, and now kind of creating a system for it. So, Robert Patrick, anyone who wants to kind of talk about yeah, the scale. I'll, I'll certainly start, and then you know Robert certainly sure. jump in. But I think one of the things that we found out pretty early on is every step of the process did not exist and had to be created, right? And so one of the things that we did first, we set up a one fifth scale of what we thought the production size would be in-house in, in, in Rhode Island. And so um, that allowed us to really test every aspect of the, what we thought the pipeline would be and then sort of augment, make changes. And, uh, you know, it's so weird. I think we were, you know, we were sort of underground for maybe two years developing that whole entire ecosystem. Um, and then, but, you know, through all that investment, you know, once we did go to scale and sort of get it in front of our production partner, um, it, it, it was much easier to get to that scale, right? We had done a lot of that homework, you know, a lot of it, you know, attributed to Robert here. And, uh, yeah, so I think that we paved the way the right way. And there again, it was that partnership being close enough to Forum Labs that we could ship back parts back and ideas back, you know, relatively quickly. Um, but having an, enough equipment that we could kind of test that at, at sort of a small scale. Yeah, and then... Just thinking about the scalability too, like we started off assuming that we weren't going to be producing as large of a number of these as we may end up doing. <laughs> but the system that we figured out with our one fifth scale and Forum Labs recommendation of Tulip, we're able to get that system in place, uh, find a way to print all of these unique heads and hairs in batches, and then put them through all of the post-processing, have them meet up at the end, get onto the action figure, and get shipped to the consumer. And it's a very secure and reliable way of operating at, at almost any scale. Yeah. We just It depends on your facility and machinery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one other core decision that was kind of made at the beginning of the project that really has served us well throughout it was the creation of sort of uh, a very flexible material system where naturally they've got many materials that are supposed to reflect all the different customers out there. Uh, but Hasbro doesn't necessarily know what color is going to be you know, most popular, what skin tones are going to be most popular, and that is something that can certainly shift. So having the Form 3 and being able to change out materials very easily can allow them to more uh, be more agile when responding to customer demands or different sort of waves of things coming yeah, through. Yeah. yeah, and that's a great point. And that's really why we picked the, the Form Labs platform in the end for our production flow, because you know it, it offers us the ability to quickly scale up based on demand, you know, as Jesse mentioned, switch colors, and really be flexible in what, how we produce that cell. And so, um, you know, it, it ends up being, you know, yes, you're producing in small batches of 25, but that's a strength of the printer, not a weakness, for sure. And I mean, actually, it kind of brings up a good point, and I think I'll direct this to you, Jesse, for the first part, at least. I mean, like you said, Patrick, you know, five, 10 years ago, the, the technology was just not here. The idea was here, people wanted it, but the scanning wasn't good enough, uh, and, and honestly, the 3D printing wasn't kind of good and scalable and repeatable enough. Um, the material switching makes a ton of sense. What else about um, the evolutions to the Form Labs uh, printers and technology has now put it in a place that Patrick and Robert can feel like very confident that this is going to work at a scale that might be beyond what it was originally imagined. Yeah, yeah. I think the first thing I'd start with is actually the printer itself. Um, so we've got a lot of great printers that have come and gone over the Form Labs um, lifespan, essentially, with the Form 3 certainly being the highest resolution and most reliable iteration of our SLA platform right now. So having a printer that can actually produce something that looks injection molded quality is probably the, the baseline. That's like step number one, which I think we've achieved with the Form 3. Um, but also on the other half of that equation certainly is the reliability of the machine. It has to be something that you can put faith in, that you can put your business behind. You know, you can kind of stamp your name on that and say, yes, the Form Labs Form 3, is, that's the one that we want to go with because it's going to have XYZ yield um, and we're going to be able to actually rely on this machine. 
Um, but I think the other thing that our, our industry, the additive manufacturing industry, is really trending towards is being able to create an ecosystem that can integrate with all the other pieces of the puzzle here. Um, certainly, Patrick and Robert have alluded to all the work and the effort that went into on the data tracking, the QC, and the scan integration. So there are many other pieces of the ecosystem that make up Selfie Series besides just the 3D printing. And Formlabs needed to be sort of open and available to integrate with those other pieces to make kind of a seamless flow there. Um, so yeah, I'd definitely summarize by saying that it's the printer, absolutely, and the materials that go along with it, but also our ability to work together um, with all the other partners that are part of Selfie Series as well. Yeah, a lot of your the software, the connections that come out of that, that's also what really makes everything possible because we're using some of the flexibility of Preform to get our automation in place. So like we don't have to physically set up every single part if we're doing thousands of pieces. And then once it comes out, we're using the APIs from Formlabs to get everything into a system and trackable. And like I mentioned earlier, able to get like get married at the end of the process and out the door. And I think the, you know, um, the part of scaling, the, the automation part, the integrations definitely helps. I think some of that also, and you kind of started talking about this a bit, is, you know, the way that you set it up, right? And so I know this audience would love as many details as you can. Some of it may be proprietary, but like, what what are the decisions you made about how many, you know, heads to print at once? Uh, talk a little bit about the hair is also 3D printed. Um, any post-processing tips? I mean, any, I think there's a lot of questions about, okay, doing this, making decisions to do this at scale while still maintaining the integrity and personality of each one. So as much as you want to talk into that, I think people would love to hear it. Um, so I think one of the, maybe the biggest challenge is the physical cleanup of the parts because of the supports that we put on them. Uh, the Form 2, we had the most experience with, with action figures and cleaning up in our lab. And it's it had a good balance of reliability, ease of cleanup, but it was still a big investment of time. When we started using the Form 3, we found we could use much smaller support points, and we, like, we really pushed that to get to a point where we can just be cracking these off supports and do minimal hands-on sanding or anything, if possible. And that just is a huge time saver in production because we we couldn't consider like you spend how many minutes sanding each right. piece when we're doing a prototype and it has to be perfect like we needed something that we'd orient a particular way support in a particular way and then be able to just put it together in the shortest amount of time so i think the flexible, the flexible tank, tank really helps with that yeah um yeah, definitely. What, what was the rest of this? Well, I was I, I was going to say that even plays into the hairstyles, right? Because we wanted to create hairstyles that we normally could not produce in a, with a traditional manufacturing yeah. means, right? Undercuts and you know a little bit more detail in the hairs because but, of the geometry because, of the yeah, yeah. because of the, you know we we knew we could push the limits a little bit on on the technology. But there again, as, as Robert pointed out, all that has to be figured out with supports and and how much you 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 do support them. So. Um, as as, as the, you know, everyone starts going through the app and you see those uh, amazing variety of hairstyles in there, you realize that there's a lot of thought and process that put behind it so that they automatically set up, they support the entire hair, and then break away and leave no trace of it. There's, so. Yeah, there's some that I love because I don't think you'd be able to injection mold it. Yeah, but you exactly. can print it, and yeah. it looks like a production piece on the part. Yeah, and that certainly is sort of a bridge for customers going from prototype to production, yeah. is thinking about how long and how many hands do I have to have to make this part actually like an end use good, a consumer product. And in that case, the minutes and the seconds are really crucial at any step. And Hasbro was extremely thorough with this testing. I think I remember a document that they sent over that had the head in pretty much every single degree orientation where they had tried printing it yeah. out. They had yeah. understood what the support cutoff would be and how long it would take for each one. Mm -hmm. So they, they really sort of optimized this products and this process to fit their needs um, with the Formlabs ecosystem such that you can create a cost-effective system. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and I think, sorry, Rory, I no, think it made ahead. sense to do the homework up ahead of time because you think about it, every head that we have coming in from the scanning, it has slightly different geometry. So we had to make sure that we set up those supports robust, that they automatically supported, and we knew we weren't going to get head fails. So, yeah. Yeah, that goes, that goes back to that, like, how are we able to standardize something that's not standard. Completely right. unique. Yeah. 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 Uh, to, and to answer your question of how did we choose how many pieces to put on the platform, it's just the most that can fit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is the tension. I think we'll get to the mass customization piece and we'd love to hear just thoughts in general. But like this, I think, is the, the best I've seen of answering that question, which is how do we get something that feels like it is completely one of one, but knowing that there's no system that could support that at a scale, right? So it's like all these incremental decisions about as many as can fit, how to align the heads and, and all this stuff so that it, when a consumer gets it, it feels like, okay, this was made just for me, but there's actually a whole process that goes in that took years of work to, to you know, automate and, and accelerate that process. Yeah. I wanna actually kind of spend a little bit of time you know, this is a unique situation, right? It's just coming out to the uh, commercial, to the masses now. Um, I know we've kind of alluded it, but amazing response, which is both a great thing and okay, now it's stressing the system. How can we figure that out? But, you know, I know that there was also a lot of parts of the process that you were getting feedback internally, externally from Formlabs, other Hasbro employees. Um, and, and you kind of alluded to this at the, the um, beginning, Patrick, like what were people really looking for? How did it change over time from like the original idea um, to you know, how did you incorporate that feedback to feel like, okay, this is actually, we had this vision it is overarching and kind of pretty close to what it was, but also adapted it based on what you're hearing, seeing from people uh, in terms of what they actually want when they order something yeah. here. Yeah, no, I, and, and you're right. I mean, when you have a project that's that long, obviously it starts changing as you have more information, right? And so when we were in that period where we were really just focused on how do we do this, how do we create it, how do we set up all the steps to make sure that we can produce this at scale, um, we were so close to the project, maybe almost too close. And then once we started getting it in front of the consumers, they were amazed that we where we were with it. They, half the people couldn't believe it could even be done. Um, and just that reinvigorated us, right? And we realized, okay, here's what the consumer is looking for. So we were at San Diego Comic Con, and uh, you know, we we scanned maybe 250 people or so, and um, every one of them was just so keyed into specific elements of trying to recreate themselves, whether it's the hairstyle, the parting line, you know, all those elements, the hair color, that they were really trying to create themselves. And we realized that that passion was there to really immortalize themselves as an action figure, you know, put their self on the shelf kind of thing that we really started focusing on that, right? And I think that'll keep us going as we look at wave two and wave three of these items, you know, more characters, you know, different hairstyles, all these other things that we can do um, to really engage with the consumer across the base. It's interesting because actually as we were just chatting before this, you mentioned something I had never heard, which is kind of echoing what you said, which is that, you know, maybe there was idea that consumers would think a little more aspirationally, right. pick yeah. a little bit hairstyles that might be something they want but have never had. And, and maybe that's what some consumers are doing, but it sounds like a lot of them are like, I want to look exactly, I want this figure to look exactly like me. Um, so was that, you know, did that create new challenges? Did it create, you know, a different approach to how you present the selfie figure? Or was it just kind of one step, another data source that, you know, kind of pushed it along as, in general? Yeah, I think, it, I think it was a data point for us that said, okay, we were on the right track. It's just a little bit of a refocus on, okay, where people are going to try and, you know, or so we think from the data set that we have right now, are going to try and recreate themselves. And so um, there again, I think that gave, gave us a lot of positive sort of uh, feedback that, okay, you know what, we have the right hair colors and styles and we, we know we can keep adding and adjusting those, um, but we were on that, you know, that right path. Awesome. Um, I want to talk a little bit, uh, I guess, in, in conclusion about mass customization in general, right? I think what's so exciting about this is that it kind of brings a little bit of reality to this term that people have used for a long time and something, you know, we talked about Hasbro had thought about, definitely something in the 3D printing world that kind of is important is the idea of, okay, how do you make something that is unique to a consumer at scale? Um, I think this whole story gave a really specific um, example of the questions you have to answer and the obstacles you have to overcome. Um, but curious just for any of you or each of you, maybe Jesse, you can start kind of like, what does this kind of, you know, predict for the future or tell a little bit about how people are gonna make consumer goods and how 3D printing and additive manufacturing might play into that going forward? Yeah, yeah, so there's the technical side, which I think is 
more or less kind of played out at this point. Everyone in the industry is certainly moving towards faster printers, better materials, and probably most importantly, more automation of being able to integrate both with automation systems in the provider's ecosystem, but also integrate with pieces of the pie that are sort of outside of the 3D printing world. And I think that that train is going to keep on moving. It's going to keep getting better and better um, for anyone who's trying to do something that's mass custom or just production with 3D printing. Um, but also on the other side, it's really about, especially with consumer goods or something that's going to end up with a consumer, it's about utilizing the value of 3D printing in a way that's going to elevate the experience for the consumer. Um, so for example, with the selfie series, uh, it makes sense for Hasbro to be picking the head and picking the hair because those are the things that the consumer is going to relate to the most. They're going to look at themselves and see it, um, but not necessarily to 3D print you know, the little accessories or the injection molded body or anything like that. Um, so Hasbro did a really great job of picking where the value is um, and really diving into that to make a better experience. And I think that is an example that can be used by a lot of other companies as well, is to say, what are the weaknesses of our traditional manufacturing methods, whether it be creating new hairstyles or making something that's customized, and then using 3D printing as a tool in that process, instead of trying to sort of overflex what 3D printing can do, use it to elevate the entire process, the entire ecosystem for the end user. That's awesome, yeah. And I mean, Robert, as someone who's definitely in the nitty gritty and the technical side, I mean, building off of what Jesse said, like, what do you think is already there? What improvements, you know, would you like to see to make this even a stronger part of your workflow? I think we started with the hardest project for this kind Always of... Always a good strategy. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> it's a strategy for sure. <laughs> um, so we learned a lot from it, and I think that we built a really good foundation of like we understand a lot of what we need now and how to partner and who to partner with and I don't know what the next piece is or the next project is but just from all of these learnings that system is there or we, or we know we can make the system with tools like the form 3 and all of the software and connections so it's inspiring and encouraging to know that we can do it. And now the, the hard part has been solved. And it's uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There are yeah. many hard parts to come, I'm sure. Yeah, and I think a lot of it is, you know, once you develop that ecosystem, right, we have that pipeline, we understand so many of the connection points, it allows us to sort of branch out and do other opportunities, right? Um, I, I think that was the hard part, was kind of coming up with that, right? Taking something that was known, you know, an equipment base and a material base as a prototype development unit and creating something that, you know, no, no, you can create, you know, mass production, you can create something for consumers directly off these printers. Um, once we realized that and we had that confidence in both materials and the platform, um, you know, I think, you know, from here, I think we'll just keep expanding. Mm -hmm. I think the other piece that, that is super important on that is the support afterwards, right? So I think, you know, you have to have that confidence in, in working with the right company to know that once you put those printers in place in a manufacturing setting, that there's a robust support system for that. And I think that's something that, you know, Jesse and, and us have worked closely on so to make sure that those printers are getting what they need every day. So. Mm -hmm. And I guess kind of stemming from that, you know, from your perspective, Patrick, obviously the selfie chapter is far from closed. There will be lots of innovations to come there. But as you start to kind of think, um, you know, even further afield and longer into the future, how do you see 3D printing or other techniques that you develop for the selfie changing the way that Hasbro brings innovative, you know, toys yeah. and products to market? I, I think it's on a couple of fronts, right? One of them is speed to market, right? So if you think about it, if you're near shore manufacturing, I can get to the consumer much faster, right? You deliver something to their door, 45, 60 days, say, right? So that allows you to hit on much more consumer-centric trends, right? Whether that's personalized product or something that's topically relevant at that time. I think the other piece is that, you know, that customized piece where I have something that you don't have, right? Or it's a little bit different. Yours, you know, resonates with you or your family and the one that I have resonates with myself and my family or my, you know, my, my sort of passions in collecting. And so I think that is certainly those two areas allows us, you know, to continue to leverage what the printing technology can do um, and deliver on both those fronts. Yeah, I think the last thing I'd add on the sort of selfie series and the things that Hasbro did right 
is kind of picking up on the trend of consumers wanting more experiences necessarily over products, um, which is really kind of at the heart of Selfie Series as well, is that through the Selfie Series and the Hasbro app, you know, fans are starting that process a little bit earlier and they're really making it an experience for them. It's not as easy as just putting something in a cart and then waiting for it to arrive. You're spending a couple of minutes, you know, scanning yourself. It's really fun. You can do it with your family. It's much more immersive than any other product really that's out there today. Um, and it allows Hasbro as well to sort of extend their reach with the consumers to help put them into this universe. Awesome. Well, I think that is a great place to end, but is there anything that we didn't touch on that you guys think is important for people to know? Yeah. All right, well then I think the natural question, which I have a sneaking suspicion is that a lot of people will uh, in the audience might wanna get this, how can people get their own selfie figures? Yeah, so if you download the Pulse Mobile app, it'll be right there at the bottom, right in the middle sort of center tile of that thing. You'll be able to press on selfie series, scan yourself, go through the entire experience of picking your figure, your hair, your skin tone, all of those elements in 45 to 60 days, that figure will show up at your door. Unbelievable. So, we are living amazing. in the Jetsons world. <laughs> uh, I want to thank everybody for tuning in, but I especially want to thank our guests here. Um, so thanks so much for this conversation. I have a thank feeling you. we'll be hearing a lot more about it, and, and I bet some questions will be coming in, and we'll have a lot more fun to tell about the, the next waves and iterations of selfie, and everyone hopefully having an amazing uh, experience with their own selfies. So All thank right. you guys so thanks, much. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Yeah, of course. All right, thanks.